Hi there, and welcome to the next in my series of Lightboard lectures on the form, function, and evolution of fish jaws. Now, the previous lectures introduced the major structural components of fish heads and outlined how jaws originated. This entry covers the major changes in jaw structure and suspension that occurred thereafter. Now, as we dive into this, note that I will keep the color coding of the skull elements consistent with my other light boards on this topic. So as I've put, produced here on this color coded key, the brain case will be in blue, the mandibular arch is in green, and the hyomandibula is in purple because it is the dorsal portion of the hyoid arch. The dermal bones around the mouth are in orange. For the purposes of this lecture, I'm omitting the rest of the orange dermal bones and the remaining gill arches, which were previously in yellow. You should recall from the previous lightboard lectures that the brain case is also called the chondrocranium or neurocranium. Remember also that the members of chondrichthyes lost their dermal bone over the course of evolution, while in osteichthyes, the dermal bones around the mouth increased in importance to become the functional biting apparatus, and the ancestral mandibular arch transformed into the palatine arch. In modern bony fishes, the green palatine arch forms the upper roof of the mouth and the rear portion of the lower jaw. In ancient fishes, as well as in modern sharks and their close relatives, the green arch is the functional jaw. Now, as I begin to work through this light board and I begin to construct diagrams, pay particular attention to the hyomandibula's position. That's going to be the bone in purple or in pink. Originally, it doesn't have much to do with the jaw at all, but as you'll see, it ends up assuming great importance. Let's start by talking about the jaw structure of placoderms, which were among the first fishes to possess true jaws. The jaw structure of placoderms was simple, as I'll draw here. Okay, so as I've drawn here, basically the upper portion of the mandibular arch, also called the palatoquadrate cartilage, which I've drawn here in green, was firmly attached to the ventral portion of the chondrocranium, or brain case, which is in blue. The lower jaw, or mandibular cartilage, also in green, was attached to the palatoquadrate cartilage near the rear of the chondrocranium by a simple joint, and the hyomandibula did not associate substantially with either the jaw or the chondrocranium. I've drawn the hyomandibula here in purple, just sort of hanging out in the posterior portion of the head. I'll also add, or I've also added, some orange elements here to remind you that a sheath of dermal bone covered the otherwise cartilaginous jaws of these early fishes. And indeed, these dermal bones are the parts that primarily fossilized. This early type of jaw is called autostylic. The autostylic jaw was a perfectly, perfectly functional and powerful jaw, but it was a bit limited in its range of movement. The lower jaw could swing open, and swing closed, and that was about it. If you've ever played classic video games, Pac-Man provides a pretty good analog. So, wop, 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 wop. This motion of the jaw was just fine for gobbling up other fishes or power pellets, but it wasn't very subtle or sophisticated. But after this, something very interesting evolves. So let me draw it for you here. Okay, so as I've drawn for you here, specifically, the hyomandibula has moved anteriorly to connect the posterior portion of the chondrocranium to the joint between the upper and lower parts of the mandibular arch. This presumably helped to provide structural support to the jaw. Jaws with this repositioned hyomandibula are called amphistylic. To my knowledge, there aren't any living fishes that possess this jaw type but lots of extinct ones did. We see amphistylic jaws in early members of chondrichthyes and osteichthyes, as well as the extinct acanthodians. Thus, the most recent common ancestor of all living jawed fishes possessed an amphistylic jaw. From there, three things happen. Somewhat entertainingly, the chimera lineage, holocephali, decides that amphistyle isn't really where it's at, and they revert to the primitive autostylic condition. That's reflected in the scientific name for their taxon, 
holocephali means whole heads and refers to the fusion of the upper jaw with the chondrocranium. Two other major lineages of fishes, elasmobranchii and osteichthyes, independently evolved something called hyostyle from the amphistylic condition. Hyostyle turns out to be one of the most important innovations in the history of fishdom. A hyostylic jaw breaks the connection between the upper jaw, the palatoquadrate cartilage, and the chondrocranium. In this jaw type, the hyomandibula will connect the rear of the chondrocranium to the joint of the lower jaw. In other words, it suspends the entire jaw apparatus from the brain case. And this is why you will sometimes see the ventral portion of the fish skull called the suspensorium. It's the portion that hangs in suspension. So let me diagram the hyostylic jaw of modern chondrichthians for you. Modern chondrichthians except for holocephali. So here's the brain case in blue and the hyomandibula in purple, affixed to the rear of the brain case by a flexible joint. And finally, here's the mandibular arch joined to the ventral portion of the hyomandibula at its joint. There are no dermal elements to draw here, because as you'll recall, modern sharks and their relatives have lost all the dermal bone that their ancestors possessed. Now, hyostyle is wonderful for a lot of reasons that we'll explore in a separate lecture. But for right now, just let me illustrate for you how this jaw type allows a motion that's not possible with an autostylic or an amphistylic jaw, in which these, these in which the lower jaw joint is fixed in place. Specifically, by breaking the connection between the upper jaw and the brain case, hyostyle allows a fish to protrude its jaws simply by swinging the hyomandibula forward. So here I've shown the jaws that have swung forward. If you've ever seen a shark bite, you'll have noticed that the jaws seem to move independently of the rest of the head. And this is how they do it. Hyostyle is so wonderful that fishes have discovered it not once, but twice. Hyostyle also evolves early in the Osteichthyan lineage, though the other transformations in the skull make it a little bit harder to see. So here, let me create a diagram of the skull of a modern teleost that recapitulates one of my earlier lightboards. So, as always, Here's the brain case in blue. I've added the hyomandibula here in purple or pink, and the palatine arch here in green. Finally, here's the functional jaw in orange. Recall that in osteichthyes, the dermal bones increase in importance while the ancestral mandibular arch becomes the palatine arch, which forms the roof of the mouth. Look where the jaw joint lies in this skull of a modern bony fish. It isn't affixed near the rear of the neurocranium the way that it was in the placoderm ancestors. Rather, it's been relocated ventrally, with the hyomandibular bridging the space between the jaw joint and the neurocranium. In other words, it is a hyostylic jaw. The new placement of the hyomandibula broke the ancestral constraint on where the upper jaw and its joint with the lower jaw must lie within the head. And that structural innovation helps osteichthians to protrude their jaws and also greatly increase their ability to evolve diverse skull and jaw shapes. We'll further explore the concept of how hyostyle enhances the structural and functional diversity of fishes in an upcoming lecture. Now, at this point, those of you interested in human evolution may be wondering how we ended up with our own jaw morphology which doesn't look very much at all like this osteichthian jaw. But aren't we also members of the bony fish lineage? Yep, we are. Which means that our ancestors went through the progression from autostylic to amphistylic to hyostylic that I just outlined. But my upper jaw is quite firmly fused to my neurocranium, and I certainly can't throw my teeth at my prey, at least not unless I end up with dentures someday. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that aside from chimeras, one other lineage of fishes has reverted to autostyle. That's the lineage that includes lungfishes and tetrapods. Tetrapodomorpha is, of course, the lineage including all the world's amphibians, birds, reptiles, and mammals, and thus also includes humans. Now, the loss of hyostyle had some functional consequences for tetrapods. 
For example, tetrapods are not nearly as good at suction feeding as teleosts are. But suction feeding isn't as useful on land as it was in the water, and the reversion to autostyly had some advantages as well, such as an improved ability to chew food with the oral jaws. So this arrow just shows the reversion to the autostylic condition that occurs in lungfishes and tetrapods. Fascinatingly, we still have a higher mandibula, but its function changed completely once it was no longer needed to suspend the jaw. Over evolutionary time, our hyomandibula shrank and became the stapes of our inner ear, a tiny bone that helps us to receive sound waves. Really, really. So let's hear it for the ability of evolution to repurpose pieces of anatomy for new uses. Okay, to recap. Over the course of this lightboard, I've shown you the three major types of jaw suspension that have appeared over the course of fish evolution. The primitive autostylic jaw transformed into the intermediate amphistylic jaw. And then in two different lineages, the upper jaw dissociated from the brain case and became suspended by the hyomandibula to form what we call the hyostylic jaw. As we'll see more extensively in coming lectures, Hyostylic jaws allowed a huge diversification of skull form and function for chondrichthyes and osteichthyes alike. Yet two lineages reverted to the autostylic jaw possessed by our placoderm ancestors. One of those lineages includes the tetrapods, and thus includes us. And with that, I think I've given you plenty to chew on, so if you have any biting commentary about the lecture, it would be a pleasure to hear from you. Otherwise, this is Dr. Sid signing off and wishing you best fishes until next time.